in this video I'm going to provide a derivation of the renewal equation as it's frequently used in epidemiology. And the derivation that we're going to use is going to closely follow a paper by Christoph Fraser in 2007 and I'm going to provide a link to that paper in the video description. So this equation that I've written down here is the renewal equation and in attempting to derive it we're going to discuss what each of these elements actually mean. And one of the elements here, RT, is what is known as the instantaneous reproduction number. So we're gonna define the instantaneous reproduction number, RT, in this video. And we're also gonna define a different type of reproduction number, which is known as the case reproduction number, which is often written RC. In order to derive this equation, we're gonna make a range of assumptions we're going to assume that our data are discrete and it's discrete at the daily level. And that's really just to make some of the derivations a little bit easier to understand, but exactly the same process holds for if instead we were considering continuous time. Our model is inherently stochastic and we're going to assume that the population are well mixed, which means that every individual can potentially mix with everyone else. And finally, we're gonna assume that there's no heterogeneity within the population. Specifically, no heterogeneity in terms of the infectiousness profiles of individuals. Okay, so let's now get to actually deriving this equation up here. So we're gonna imagine that there is an individual and at some point they become infected with a pathogen. And then we can imagine drawing a graph which describes on the bottom axis the time since they were infected and we're going to call that quantity tau and on the vertical axis we're going to write or we're going to denote the infection rate. So this is the rate per unit time at which an individual causes infections in other individuals and we can imagine a kind of infection rate graph that look, might look something like this. So over the course of their infection, individuals are infectious at different rates. Initially, perhaps when they become infected, it takes some time for the pathogen to undergo certain changes and to profligate throughout the body such that then it can be shed and infect other individuals. So initially, the infection rate is relatively low. Then you reach a kind of peak infection rate and then later on in the infection, as perhaps the body clears the infection, the infection rate goes down. So at the moment, I've drawn this as a kind of continuous graph, but now I want to basically convert this into a kind of daily quantity. So I'm just writing down here days since infection, so one day, two day, and so on. And we can imagine kind of discretizing this whole graph here along the lines of what I'm drawing here. And obviously I have just truncated this graph here uh, at seven, in theory, this graph goes off forever into infinity. And we're gonna denote this quantity here, which is a discrete quantity now, by beta of tau. And beta of tau is just our infection rate on a particular day tau since an individual was infected. And the number of people infected per unit time depends on a few different things. It depends on the pathogen load within an individual and the rate at which that pathogen is shed and it also depends on the contact rates with susceptible individuals. So notice that unlike in compartmental models we're not actually explicitly accounting for susceptible individuals in the form of a compartment but beta here plays the role of basically tracking how the number of susceptible individuals may change over the course of an epidemic. And if individuals can recover from an epidemic and remain immune, then in theory, over time, beta should go down because there are fewer susceptible individuals available. So now we can ask the question, what is the sort of average number of individuals that were infected on day three since an individual is infected. So let me just state that another way. What is the average number of individuals that 
a person will infect on day three since they were infected. So from this graph, the way in which we construct this quantity beta here, it actually turns out that on the third day, then that individual, to work out the sort of average number of individuals that that person would infect, it's just the area underneath that graph. And so in this case, it would just be equal to beta of three, in theory, times one day, right? Because one day is the width here of this graph. And that makes sense because beta is a sort of per unit time, in this case, per day uh, rate of infection. So we need to multiply it by a day in order to get the average number of individuals that that individual would infect on the third day after their infection. So then we can ask a far more general question, which is what would be the sort of total number of uh, people who would be infected throughout uh, that individual's lifetime? or you can think about it as the sort of lifetime of infection. And we actually need to say uh, on average here as well, because our model accounts for there to be some variability between the number of individuals uh, which are infected. This model is inherently stochastic. So the total number of people that that individual would infect on average would be the sort of number of individuals that we'd expect them to infect on day one, then the number of people we'd expect them to infect on day two and so on. And so on day one, we'd expect them to infect uh, beta one individuals in theory times one day again, but I don't need the times one day because it's just one Plus the number of individuals they'd infect on day two plus the number of individuals they'd infect on day three and so on right forever And we can write that succinctly as a sum so we can say it's the sum from tau equals one to infinity of beta tau and we can see that this represents a kind of reproduction number, right? It's the number of secondary cases that that individual would infect over the course of their lifetime. But I'm not gonna define it particularly uh, thoroughly now because I'm actually going to introduce something else into our model which is gonna allow us to differentiate between two different types of reproduction number. Specifically, what we're gonna assume now is that beta tau is not constant over time. And that could be the case for many different reasons. We could be running out of susceptible individuals. There may have been interventions which authorities have brought in which effectively perhaps reduce the contact rate between individuals. There could be new variants of disease such as what happened during COVID-19 when new variants came in and a host of other things. For example, individuals could on their own choose to reduce their contact rates as again we saw during COVID-19. People tended to reduce their levels of contact likely in response to the ongoing epidemic. So now as we allow beta of tau to vary over time, we're actually going to rename it. We're gonna rename it of beta t comma tau so tau here is just, again, still the number of uh, days since infection. And t here is just calendar time. So over time, infectiousness varies. So now that we've allowed the infectiousness of an individual to vary over time and the time since they were infected, we can define our two reproduction numbers. And we're first gonna define the instantaneous reproduction number, which I just denote here as r subscript t. And this is just the average number of people that an individual would infect if conditions remain the same as they were today. So to get this, all we do is we just sum up those areas underneath the graph. So we sum from tau equals one to infinity of beta t comma tau. And so you realize that the reason we have t here is because implicitly when we do this sum, we're not allowing this element to vary. We're assuming that transmission remains the same as it was today at time t. So this is why it's called the instantaneous reproduction number. It's because it's instantaneous in respect to the current condition now. So if transmission remained the same, what would be the average number of people that an individual would infect over the course of their lifetime? So this is what's known as the instantaneous reproduction number. Now I want to define a different quantity. And this quantity I'm gonna denote RC, and it's what's known as the case reproduction number. 
And the case reproduction number is the average number of people that the person will infect throughout the course of their infection. And so that accounts for potential changes in future transmission. So we actually would work this out in a slightly different way where we sum from tau equals one, equals one to infinity of beta of t plus tau comma tau. And so we're allowing effectively the transmission rate to change over the course of their infection. And that's why we're now adding tau to this first element here to account for that. Okay, and so that's what's known as the case reproduction number. But let's now get back to our derivation of the renewal equation. And the next step we're gonna make is an assumption. We're gonna assume that beta t comma tau is the product of two things. It's the product of a function which depends only on calendar time and another function which depends on the time since infection. And by writing this in this way, we are making an assumption which is that the relative progression of infectiousness is independent of calendar time. And importantly, this would be violated if at some point in time, a public health measure was brought in where individuals who were symptomatic were isolated. Because then there would be a difference in terms of how infectiousness changed over time since an individual was infected, uh, which changed at some point in time when this public health measure was brought in. We're now gonna make a less restrictive assumption, which is that we're gonna assume that the sum from tau equals one to infinity of omega or w tau is equal to one. And we're free to do that because we've got the product of two things here. So if I define this in that way, then essentially phi just takes up the slack of that. Okay, so now that we have these two assumptions, we can go ahead and I'm gonna do something which might seem a bit strange at first, but I'm just gonna sum beta t of tau over all possible tau values. So I'm gonna sum from tau equals one to infinity of beta t comma tau, and then just replacing that here with this product, I get the sum from tau equals one to infinity of phi of t times omega of tau. And then I can just take the phi of t outside, because, so then I just get phi of t because t doesn't depend on tau, times the sum from tau equals one to infinity of omega tau. And by our, our second assumption, I can just replace this with one. So we have this whole process just results in phi of t. So why have I done that? Well, the reason I've done that is because we know from our definition of the instantaneous reproduction number that the instantaneous reproduction number is just the sum from tau equals one to infinity of beta t of tau, which is what we've done down here. So we know that this whole thing equals the instantaneous reproduction number. And so we know that this thing here that we've got out at the end, phi of t, is just the reproduction number, the instantaneous reproduction number rather. So then we can write beta t of tau is equal to the instantaneous reproduction number times omega of tau. And so you may find yourself wondering what does this second quantity here actually represent? It depends only on the amount of time that has passed since an individual was infected. Well, what does this measure? It measures effectively a probability distribution. It's a probability distribution because we know that it's, it's normalized and all of the individual weights are, are non-negative. So it's a probability distribution governing the sort of time which typically elapses from a primary infection to secondary infections. In other words, infections caused by the primary infection. And so this is what actually defines a concept which is known as the generation time distribution. And you'll note that I've been a little bit woolly in how I've spoken about this. And it turns out that there are quite a few different ways to define a generation time distribution. And I'm gonna put a link to a paper which does so in a much more thorough way than I have done so here. But you can still think about it as representing a sort of generation time distribution. What typical time elapses between a primary case and subsequent cases caused by it? Okay, so it may not seem it, but we're actually very close to deriving the renewal equation as it's typically used in epidemiology. But in order to get the final step, I want us to consider a particular example. Let's imagine that 
three days ago there were five infections which began and apart from those five infections there were no other infections on any other days so on days four five etc ago there were no infections and similarly there were no infections one day ago or two days ago so we can say well what would be the average number of infections we would expect to be caused today given that there were five infections which began three days ago if we assume that all of those individuals are the same then we can essentially say that the number of infections caused today would be five because there were five individuals who were infected uh, three days ago times the infection rate beta which depends on the current time and the time since infection which now is just three days and then in theory we need to multiply this by one day in order to uh, move this from a per unit of time measure to, to something which is dimensionless. But then we can use our definition for what beta is to give us five times the instantaneous reproduction number, RT, times omega of three. And we're gonna rewrite this a little bit so that it facilitates writing down the renewal equation. This is just equal to R of T times omega of three times the number of cases three days ago, which is just gonna be I of T minus three. Okay, so we sort of realized that these individuals that, that were infected three days ago caused would, would cause on average this sort of quantity of infections today, but it's kind of trivial to imagine how we could extend this framework to imagine if we had a more general set of infections occurring in the past. So we might have some infections occurring on day four, day two, day one, and so on and so on. So if we wanted to work out the average number of infections happening today, in other words, the expected number of infections occurring today, we would get that by summing from tau equals one to infinity, RT times omega tau times I of T minus tau. And notice that what this is implicitly doing is we're gonna get here, I'm just gonna take RT out the front here, I get omega one times I of T minus one. So that's the number of infections that we expect to uh, be generated today from infections which began one day ago. In theory, I need RT in front of that too, right? Plus the number of infections we would expect to be generated today by infections that began two days ago and so on, right? Up into infinity. Okay, and so now we have derived the basic renewal equation as it is used in epidemiology.